one third of 1FD out of 100 people were focused on the website. And everybody was saying, we need more. We need to focus more. Um, but then I went to the students and you survey the students and talk to the students and focus group them and say, how many of you on a daily basis come through our virtual front door versus our physical front door? And more than half of the time, our students were coming through our virtual front door. They were coming to the website. They were getting e-journals. There really are, in our field, three kind of electronic databases that serve most of the needs of our students. Not to say paper and journals, other things don't matter, but it's the predominance of the usage was in one area, and yet our resource allocation a couple years ago, our HR, uh, was one-third of one FT. We are so out of whack in this space that we absolutely have to start from scratch. We have to have a new whiteboard approach, I think, to thinking through how we are staffing these learning institutions, because what the other option is we add one person here or there. Right? We, we say we're creating a new digital position, and that's great. We should do that. Um, but that's not the end game. It can't be that when we have one free FTE, we kind of stick one person over there to do digital initiatives or digital scholarship or whatever. That's not going to work. It's out of scale. It's out of whack. And it causes confusion. Right? We haven't yet linked up, I think, the virtual and the physical in ways that our students can understand. So this is a side elevation, a picture of the building I work in called Langdale Hall. Um, and I like this image as a provocation, too, um, because it reminds me that when we're building learning environments like the building we're in here, um, you presumably start with an architect, right? You have a bunch of students and a provost, maybe, and some faculty who sit down with an architect and say, this is the learning environment we want to create. So in this case, in the middle is our library, and there are classrooms on either side, and some offices and so forth for faculty. Um, and you have a drawing, right? You have a scheme, and you think through the architecture of this space that you're creating. It strikes me that we have not yet done this work for the information age. We have not yet thought through the architecture of the learning environment that joins the virtual and the physical, much less looks at the virtual itself. The virtual is just happening. It's just burgeoning, right? And we still have these buildings that were designed for the physical space. Um, but this, I think, is really a challenge when so much of the learning is happening in this other space. It's connected to the physical. We need to figure out those connect points. It's not um, disembodied. Um, but we need to rethink this connection. And to me, it's a process of doing a design charrette. We need to find the way to have information architects and physical architects and the teachers and students in a room. So this I commend to you uh, what you are doing because I think you guys are embarking on exactly the design charrette that you have to do to envision this from the ground up as something that connects the virtual and the physical. Um, and I think uh, this is the right place to start. Uh, okay, so um, what are some of the approaches one might take against this very long and complex backdrop? Um, one of the jobs I have at Harvard is on our new Harvard Library Board. So uh, here's one of our many problems is we have 73 different libraries. So the investment in libraries per se is $170 million a year at Harvard and so there are 1,000 people who do it in 73 distinct libraries. That is great in terms of investment fabulous in terms of investment. The deans are terrific to do that, um, but it's crazy in terms of organization. We have many, 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 many too many chiefs, and we're not particularly well coordinated. And one of the things we've not been able to do well is to have a common strategy, to say this is where we're going as a library system. We've had lots and lots of little strategies that have gone on um, uh, independently. So uh, one of my jobs is to co-chair strategy and innovation, the um, group that is within the university trying to figure out how do we direct this um, very large library system in some particular areas that will help to build this future as part of this visioning. So I'm going to play out a few of the things that we're working on. This is not um, meant to be the right prescription for any other institution, but just to give you some of the areas where we are uh, pushing ahead. Um, the first one, just to go back to the point about the kids and the teachers, is being very, very careful to keep studying the people we work with. So we keep asking through surveys and focus groups consistently, how is your learning changing? We want to know a ton about what the format preferences are, how people are getting information, how they are failing to get information, and so forth. So part of this campaign, this doesn't sound strategic or innovative maybe, um, but is to be really good social scientists about this and to be consistently asking this question. So just as one um, small example, I was describing to you the example of the law students who um, don't tend to take the law books off the shelf. Um, all the same, we have been asking our students in, uh, in this particular field and others too um, about their format preferences every year. Um, and when you ask them about uh, audio files or about video or about journals or whatever, and newspapers, they always say digital, right? It's, that's plain. Um, but the one anomaly is when it comes to regular old books. So not so much the um, 
uh, the books, the journals come in because that's, uh, they want those electronically. But when it comes to a monograph, just a kind of a, uh, uh, or a novel or something, um, what do you think the skew is, the split in terms of wanting it in a digital format versus in a physical format if they have to choose for students? What's the guess? 60 40, which way? Preference for the book. Yeah. Other guesses? 80 20. 80 20, which way? Books 80. Books 80. So it's in, right in between the two. I understand it's different. So I'm saying in law, in our particular field, it's 70% prefer the book of our students and 30% want, would prefer the ebook. Um, and when we ask them about the case book, they're about the same, but then they say, well, you don't give us good case books, so we, we want it. So if we gave them better things, we, they would go for it. I, I mention this only because it's about, the numbers actually are relatively similar for students and um, for grown-ups. And often when you, <laughs> when you ask, um, when you ask adults um, in a focus group setting after you've, um, uh, after you've done the survey, why? Um, they often have some variant of the three Bs, the bed, the bath, and the beach, right? That's why you like the sort of tactile form of the book. Um, and students say roughly the same thing. So there's actually more correlation when it comes to reading and format um, than one would have thought. So as we hurdle toward you know, digital formats in all these ways, we also have a sense that people prefer, and maybe, maybe it has something to do with learning, we're not sure yet, um, prefer the physical in some cases. And you're quite right that I teach this semester in the design school as well. Those design students want nothing but physical books. Why? Because you know they're big format images, right? They, it doesn't help them to have it on an iPad. So it does matter a lot, discipline specific, which was my earlier point. Um, okay, so one is really paying close attention to our users as the um, habits change, but not guessing, actually trying to get the data. Um, two, and I won't go too far into this, but is really rethinking our collection development strategies. As I mentioned before, our heuristic before, uh, in years past, was simply to buy everything, basically buy everything that we could. Um, that was a myth. We never really could buy everything, but that was sort of more or less the idea. Um, and we wanted the biggest collection, the biggest kind of stack of stuff, and we competed on the basis of collection. No more. So yes, we want to have the best collection in many respects in terms of being able to provide fast access to things. But the idea is not simply to beat Yale or beat whomever else because we have a higher stack of books. Um, we know that only one or two percent of what we in fact have in the collection ends up circulating, right? It's a very small percentage of what we buy uh, people end up using. Um, and we know there are lots of things that people want, data sets and other materials that they really want and really would use immediately that we don't get for them. Um, so this is just an image that I've created to um, have a visual of our emerging collection development um, uh, uh, plan. And the way of thinking about it is, on the one hand, to think about what are unique and rare materials? What are things that only we have? Those are the things where we have a complete permanent commitment to having them in physical um, format, to digitizing them, making them freely available as much as we can. But that's kind of the traditional collect it and have it kind of stuff. On the other end of the um, spectrum, uh, where it says temporary, uh, we're increasingly saying we're not collecting that stuff. So an example in my field, and again, it's discipline specific, but I think you'll have analogs um, in your own field, is the laws of the Swiss cantons. We used to buy all the laws of the Swiss cantons and bring them to Cambridge, Massachusetts. And what would happen is they would come into our basement, they would be stamped, and they would be sent out to our depository, 26 miles away, never to be touched again, right? And the scholars who are working on the laws of the Swiss cantons are getting them on a perfectly good website that the Swiss are keeping up with real efficiency and consistency, okay? So the idea of our spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, much less people time, much less you know, cataloging effort and so forth, and storage space on the laws of the Swiss cantons when they're perfectly well cared for in the European Union, um, we've quit collecting those. Now, that may seem like an easy case, um, but I think there are more of those cases than we think in the library world. And my view is we don't have a choice. On that end of the spectrum, we have to be more collaborative. We have to expect that other people are going to be doing more collecting. We have to find faster and better ways to share, um, and there are challenges to that. But I think breaking down the idea that what it means to collect is to have it physically and to go much more to an access model is crucial. Um, and I just want to say even schools that have traditionally been in that full, like bring it here, uh, model, uh, it's not that anymore. Um, okay, one of your uh, uh, second series of uh, breakouts, the um, uh, breakout number three at 1040 is about open access and um, subscription. So I mentioned this serials crisis that we have. I don't know if it's true in your library system, but it's something like 80-20 in our library system in terms of expenditures between serials and... Uh, 90-10? Okay, very helpful. So in any event, it's a big, it's a big um, skew, and, and to the extent that that's an sort of ever-rising cost, and one where 
our, it feels like the job of librarians is what do we cancel when it comes to serials as opposed to you know how can we get um, uh, knowledge to our users. Um, I think there has to be a number of different kinds of interventions. One of the difficulties is as the buyers of this information, we too rarely have a plan B. Right? So we go into these negotiations, and we know that our faculty want you know, science or whatever it is. Um, and so we sit across from a uh, you know, negotiator on the other side who's a better negotiator than we are. Um, and we say, you know, we really need science, but we want to pay less for it. Right? What's our plan B? Where, what's our negotiating leverage? Exactly zero. Right? Um, so we need some form of plan B. I'm not sure that I know what the plan B is, but we need one, um, and we need it relatively soon. Um, there's a bigger picture plan B, though. Um, which I really think is the open access movement. I was speaking with the dean of your pharmacy school earlier. I think this is, in, uh, uh, in effect, the most important thing that we could be doing as libraries in partnership with faculty and deans and provosts, because I think it will break a bad cycle and it will get more access to more knowledge in the world at large. So the version we have undertaken at Harvard is to have a mandate um, in many of our schools, a mandate that says when we publish an article, we agree to make it open access as well as to publish it in other places. Um, it's an opt-out scheme. So let's imagine you want to publish something with a particular publisher and can't convince them. You can write to your dean and say, I'm opting out for this particular article. And you can say, I had peanut butter for breakfast. Doesn't matter your reason, it's just you get opted out immediately. But the presumption is every time you publish, you're making it available. So how do, does one do that? As a copyright lawyer, I'm interested in this, you may not be, um, but the notion is that the faculty member retains the copyright in the work entirely. Usually you give it away very quickly to the publisher. You say, no, I'm retaining it, and I will give two non-exclusive licenses out. One goes to Harvard, to my employer, and the other goes to the publisher. And the non-exclusive license says, you may publish it as you like, um, but you can't stop me from publishing it in this repository, in this online repository. So ours is called DASH, um, Digital Access to Scholarship at Harvard. Lots of people have others. I know um, URI has one. Um, but the model here is basically to say, yes, we want to publish it in these things, and absolutely, go make money from it. That's fine if a publisher wants to make money from it. But we are going to take a form of it, and we're going to put it on the internet and make it freely available, full stop. So um, this is something that is very much a work in progress. Um, we've made this pledge. Um, not as many faculty do it as should. Um, faculty haven't yet, I think, speaking for my own colleagues, um, gotten enough of the message that this is part of the workflow. Um, we haven't, I don't think, realized the difficulties associated with the serials crisis. If you pause and think about it, there's a closed loop here, more or less, right? We are the talent, right? We are, and the universities pay us um, to be the talent. Very often, we're the publishers. So in, in different fields, the universities are often associated with or, uh, or overseeing the publications, sometimes, of course, in the context of a commercial venture. And third, we're the buyers, right? We as libraries are the ones paying for it. We can break this cycle, but it will take an all-hands-on-deck effort, and we'll take all universities and all scholars standing together and saying, we're going to change this model, and it's going to be better for the world. Um, there are some potential downsides. We can get into that, but I don't think they are anywhere close to the importance and the benefit of this. Um, and I think even when you get to a granular level, and you've got a faculty member saying, I can't do that, I won't get promoted, or it's not as prestigious a journal, or whatever it might be um, in the system, one answer has to be the provost or the president or the dean has to stand up and say, you know what, it's going to be okay. You'll still get promoted, right? That we're looking at the quality of the work, we're not just using the proxy of the journal, and maybe we actually prefer you to do it, open access. In our particular case, now that we have the mandate, this is coming from the provost, this is something that the provost says, when we have you up for an ad hoc to determine whether you're going to get tenure, um, we may actually think this person's been an open access advocate, that's a good thing, not something that is something to be feared. So that's clearly one piece of it. Another one, though, is that I think there are empirical benefits to doing this. So just as an example, the most recent article I published, which was last Monday, um, was one about um, uh, kids and technology and how their parents uh, lie to get them on Facebook. So a majority of kids who are 12 in America are on Facebook, which is uh, the law disallows that, it turns out. Um, and we did a nationwide study, and the study showed that parents very often know and very often help kids do it. Okay? So we had this article to publish. And um, we published in an open access journal. Um, there were unbelievable benefits to doing this.